Thank you for the introduction. And um, I guess that a talk on data sharing and germplasm movement doesn't get everybody out of bed in the morning. So let's see where, where we're going with this talk. Um, I'm really grateful to the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. I'm not familiar with the wheat community, and I am enjoying myself very much and the interactions with all of you. So the question at the beginning is, why share? And I start out with a kind of philosophical beginning here. Humans have always shared. In fact, it's in our nature to share. Sharing creates and sustains relationships. It enhances knowledge, and it protects us from ignorance. Sharing is very powerful. It helps us reach our goals. It increases competence, and it brings many rewards. Knowledge sharing is a fundamental process of civilization. It is central to learning, and it creates a sense of community. Making specific knowledge available to the right people at the right time is key to achieving goals, particularly in the scientific community. People who have knowledge and relevant data typically gain respect when they share what they know. Today, information technologies codifies and helps us manage knowledge and data sharing in ways that were not available to humans before. In the information age, we share more content from more sources with more people than ever before. In fact, along with this capacity for sharing that the social media provides, we've now also created an elaborate legal system designed to inhibit sharing or to at least protect ownership of knowledge through intellectual property laws. So there's a constant tension between the desire and the natural proclivity to share and the rewards that come from not sharing and being able to own value. Germplasm sharing is historically something that we, go all, that we all consider to be in the public domain. Plant genetic resources and breeding materials were shared openly and moved rapidly around the globe for thousands of years. Germplasm was conceived of and treated as a public good. It was available to all without restriction, and its value was enhanced, not diminished by use. But over the last 50 years, free and open germplasm exchange has been slowly restricted. The reasons for this are many. In part, I think many people point to the various interpretations of the Treaty on Biological Diversity. They point to expanded legal protection of varieties, uh, often partly at least uh, dating back to the TRIPS agreement. We see the privatization of plant breeding and plant breeding research, which permeates um, many aspects of the work that we're all involved with. And at the same time, we recognize that there are significant spillover effects of biotechnology and genomics that make it more valuable than ever to protect and to own. So out of this slide, I just want you to think for a moment about the fact that germplasm has taken on a kind of new dimension with genomics and biotechnology in that we can share information about germplasm in ways that we never could before, and we can gain insight into what that germplasm might do for us or what its value might be uh, based only on an understanding of its genotype. And since genotypic information can move very quickly and is not, in fact, subject to the same laws as the germplasm itself, we're living in a new era when it comes to how to exchange information pertaining to germplasm. So biotechnology and genomics are actually a major um, technological advance, and they have some very serious and very important implications for those of us sitting in this room today. The Borlaug Global Trust, Global Rust Initiative aims to utilize biotechnology, genomics, and classical breeding to develop and deploy rust-resistant wheat varieties to try to contain the threat of rust around the world. We use both genomics and biotechnology to identify host resistance genes, to provide markers for selection so we can pyramid or create multigenic forms of resistance more readily. It allows us to create novel forms of resistance or immunity, maybe not even using natural gen genetic variation, but building on it as we understand it better. 
It enables us to model and undertake genomic prediction, which underscores the impact that knowing something about genotype can mean. It's supposed to increase breeding efficiency. I think for many breeders it has, but I think for others it may be a question as to whether it's actually increased efficiency or just added on a layer of cost, intellectual property protection, and technological requirements. And of course, biotechnology and genomics provide the basis for the very intellectual property protection that we have to now manage. So it's a bit of a circle for everyone, knowing that the having the knowledge that comes from the, from the genomics is very important in moving our breeding programs forward, while at the same time, uh, we do now have to deal with the fact that that knowledge is largely um, something people value, want to sell, and in fact, we all want very much to be recognized for the work that we do. So the BGRI advocates the sharing of data and germplasm among participants to hasten the development of resistance, and at the same time, I think, respects the fact that there are forms of sharing that require legal agreements and documents, and we all need to know how to negotiate those agreements so that we can move forward together. So the rules of exchange are, are many, and I am not an expert in this area, so I just want to say that for me, we have to recognize that there are two fundamentally different types of germplasm that we're dealing with. One are the land races and wild species, the things that we find in gene banks, both national and international around the world, and the other are our advanced breeding lines, which are maintained and developed within breeding programs and normally not released until they're ready. These two different types of germplasm are actually governed by different rules of exchange. So gene banks, and particularly uh, the international gene banks, are governed by the International Treaty on Biological Diversity, and they distribute free of charge but under an SMTA to anyone who requests germplasm from the international seed banks. On the other hand, the national gene banks, where many, many additional accessions are held, um, operate under a slightly different set of rules, and many of them do not actually exchange outside of the borders of the country in which they're found. Many times these negotiations, or the negotiation to have access to something when you are not a national, can, with time and patience, um, be negotiated. But it is not part of a very easy system and is certainly not part of a transparent system at this time. Breeding lines, on the other hand, usually require bilateral agreements between the breeder and the person or institution asking for the germplasm. Some breeding lines are distributed freely if there's no intellectual property, um, but there are formal agreements that are needed if the, if the breeding lines are protected or are going to be protected. Data, on the other hand, um, follows a slightly different set of procedures, but not entirely. There are bi- or multilateral agreements pertaining to data exchange, and many of you exchange data informally among yourselves or in certain close or local networks. And then there's the concept of having a centralized data and information resource that might be something that a project as big and as, as global and as important as this one um, might need to consider. A centralized data and information resource can have open access where anyone is freely available to look at what's in that database. It can have closed access where you have to either pay a subscription fee or have some kind of uh, password or be, um, be given permission to look at the database, or it can be a combination of the two. In the rice world, we're actually developing an international rice information consortium, which is a combination of closed and open architecture within that data resource. Things that you find uh, inside a database like this that might be helpful to this group include things having to do with, for instance, the genomic fingerprints or the genomic, the sequence of the varieties and many of the donor as well as the parental varieties that, that you work with. It could have uh, resistance gene haplotypes, information about those genes in terms of their map position, different alleles at different genetic loci, and in which varieties those loci are found. It can include pedigree information so that you can start to understand which blocks in the genome are identical by descent in the materials that you work with in your local breeding programs, 
Many of them actually trace back to common ancestors. It can help you understand genetic relationships, population structure, and see how germplasm clusters um, and how the genetics actually corresponds to performance. These databases can also house information on phenotype, environment, and many of the components, the complex real world components that you deal with every day, details that after you finish your study are often lost and cannot be retrieved unless you um, submit them to a database at the time that they're fresh in your mind. A great deal of very valuable data about the location, the environment, the weather, the particulars of your experimental design. All of these things are generally lost after experiments are concluded because we don't have data structures that can easily hold them. I think we need to create those data structures. It's becoming more important for the work we're able to do. We use ontologies and controlled vocabularies to enable us to search databases. And it's a, it's a dream, of course, but I think many people have been working for a long time to create ontologies and controlled vocabularies so that work you do in wheat could be readily um, compared to work that's going on in rice or maize or soybean or many other crop species in the world that are suffering from some of the same problems, both in terms of abiotic and biotic stress, as well as in terms of yield enhancement. So there's great potential to leverage information across crops if we work within controlled vocabularies. We're confronting this problem that we call big data. It sounds like, um, I guess I should have put a picture of a huge tractor or a front loader pushing a big pile of dirt. We've got a kind of avalanche of data coming at us. The high throughput data collection that comes off of sequencing and all of the omics platforms, the genomics, the transcriptomics, the metabolomics, the, you know, you name it. Um, it's generating so much data so quickly that it outpaces our ability to analyze and make sense of those data. And we really urgently need standards to help guide our, the ways in which we collect the data, manage, annotate, curate, share it, and integrate it with other forms of data. There's a global initiative underway um, that is trying to assemble the potential for this to happen. And as people in different crop communities or different um, local communities um, catch wind of it, I hope that they'll be alert to the potential that this has for them to gain power in the future by conforming to those standards in terms of where they submit and how they submit their data so that that data itself will be a springboard for leveraging um, more and much greater insight in the future. We need improved experimental designs that, are, that will help us optimize the value of the field evaluation. And the field evaluation is currently the most, um, the most expensive. It requires the most skill, the most training, and far, is far and away the most valuable contribution that anyone is making uh, to the crop breeding communities today. Ex improved experimental designs that take advantage of big data can save many people many hours in the field and actually provide them with a greater uh, bang for their buck, as they say, bigger output for the same investment of time and energy. And I think that these kinds of thoughts about how genomics not only costs you, but the fact is that phenotyping is the major cost and genomics can make that more efficient. And that's a major contribution that we need to look at very carefully. In any case, it's critically important to link genotypic, phenotypic, and environmental information with the seed stocks that you work with, with the genetic resources that are being evaluated. This creates an enormous tracking problem. We have to not only track the seeds, but we have to track the data that's being generated, the generation, of course, of the seeds that we originally received from some other source, and we need to be able to uh, connect the dots. We need to be able to connect the genotypes with the phenotypes. We've been doing this for many years in um, some of the major databases, and I worked with the Grameen database for quite a while, so I show you just the schema for what we call the diversity side of that database. It's been supplanted now, and the reason it's been supplanted is because there's just too much genotype data and it will no longer fit in the structure that we had.
but I still want to outline this for you because it's quite an important starting point. And for many, it may be important to realize how a database requires you to change some of the methods that you use currently. In order to have a database that has an organizational structure so that you can find information when you go back to retrieve it, you have to start to track your seed stocks. We do this predominantly now with barcodes. Track your experiments, your replications. Of course, track genotypes and phenotypes. Describe how you measure your phenotypes in very precise language. Describe the environment and provide a number of um, important information points to link that environment to the performance that you observe. We have to provide data upload and data download uh, options and structures so that it's easy for you to submit and easy for you to retrieve data in a format that you can work with. We have to develop querying tools so that you can go into the database, find things, and actually understand what it is you're looking at. We need pipelines that make it easy for people who are not experts in statistics to run genome-wide association mapping if that's what they choose to do, to do, undertake multivariate analysis and do data mining to find out which alleles, perhaps, at resistance loci are found in, in, in stocks in, in Simmet's gene bank. These are all things that are perfectly possible if the data is put into a, a structured database. So the way in which we originally started out, and I'll show you something else in a minute, was to simply think about things in buckets. So we have a genotype bucket, a germplasm bucket, a phenotype bucket, and then all the details on the actual observational trials that many of you are involved in. The genotype captures a wide range of polymorphisms. It can be, today it's almost all SNPs. It can be in, in insertion deletion polymorphisms. It supports the full range of ploidy options, and it connects sequence to genome maps, both genetic maps and physical maps. The germplasm module uh, connects pedigree information, seed stock information, where things come from. It tracks provenance, and it, and it also tracks seed stocks that have been genotyped in another institution so that you know that your seed stock, in fact, corresponds to a, geno a genotype or a sequence from somewhere else. The phenotype can handle quantitative or qualitative traits, and it, it does this all through the use of ontologies and control vocabularies. The field or plan observational data is probably the thing that makes the most difference in terms of your field books. As you know, there have been international efforts to develop uh, electronic field books, none of which have been entirely satisfactory. So people each have their own way of, of managing and handling their field books. But what we try to do is be able to extract information that links the individual plant sample back to its performance, if in fact that's the data you have, and track it to the replication, the location in the field, the environment, and of course the climate at the time the plant was growing. With these simple modules, you can start simply and gain in complexity as you go. But just thinking about a database that has genotype and phenotype all connected to the germplasm samples you work with is the starting and most essential point. Each of these arrows means that they have to be connected and you have to know and be able to trace uh, where things come from. Information resources that are being developed under the BGRI or in association with other programs on wheat Myself not being the expert, please, I hope you'll forgive me, but I've just pulled down a few of them, and I think you'll understand that there are many, many ways in which you're all accessing data, both electronically and through your interpersonal connections here at meetings and in other fora. What's important is that you're trying to track the spread of this UG99. You're trying to also um, distribute information about resistance genes and deploy them strategically and effectively throughout the world to try to keep this, uh, this under control, to try to essentially contain the damage. There are toolkits that are being developed under multiple projects. Many of them, if you've never seen them, may be of interest to you, and I would encourage you to either go online or talk with people here who are developing these toolkits. As people try them and find that they're useful or try them and make constructive criticism, 
these toolkits all get improved. And as they get improved, they become more useful. As they become more useful and more people use them, we evolve standards. So standards do not have to come from the top down. Standards can actually bubble up uh, from the ground up. But they can't bubble up from the ground up unless people make an attempt and understand the value that it would have for them uh, to start to use standard, standardized data formats and data sharing routines. So the question is, can we connect the dots? Everything is moving very quickly. Data and information is moving. UG99 is moving. Many people here and elsewhere have information that could help others, but it's not always available in, in time or in ways that are useful. Germplasm movement, although it's more restricted than the information sharing, um, is also potentially a moving resource and one that needs to be negotiated respectfully but it is a moving resource. And keep in mind that information alone can be critical. There are many, many different sources of the same alleles. Most alleles in the world are already distributed on many continents and in many genetic backgrounds. It's just very difficult without genomics to detect which alleles you have in your material or in material that may be publicly available. There are also many forms of local adaptation, and as readers you know that well, that's really what you spend your lives doing, is creating the right combinations of alleles that are locally appropriate. That germplasm is valuable, but it may be more valuable to you than it is to someone else. And many times people who protect germplasm are actually somewhat in denial about how valuable that germplasm may be. The germplasm may be very valuable to you, its value on the open market may be much less than you presume. If what we really need to know is information about what's in your germplasm, understandably, you want at some level to own that information as well as the germplasm, and you may not want that information spread about. But a thoughtful, concerted, and systematic effort to look carefully at what you really have and to understand its true value may in the end be the best strategy. The public sector has been doing a very good job over many years in providing information and genetic resources that are useful in this effort. They've created, we call them in RICE, chromosome segment substitution lines with these introgressions across the genome from wild or land race accessions in an adapted elite genetic background, but I don't know what the wheat community probably calls them, introgression lines or, or something biparental populations useful for QTL mapping, and then, of course, the magic populations that we heard about yesterday in a very exciting development for the wheat community. All of these types of genetic stocks are available publicly, many of them with full marker sets, and the power of these is not so much that they can serve as breeding lines, of course not, but they can, they can help you understand what's in your breeding lines and come to some understanding about whether you're really looking for new alleles or whether you're just trying to recombine what you have. Keep in mind that if you're working with uh, introgression lines, a, a cluster of 80 lines covers the whole genome. And you can, with, these, with low resolution, you can determine what uh, genes confer which traits in which segments of the genome. For biparental crosses, namely QTL analysis and things you've been doing for many years, it takes about 300 lines to get that information, and the resolution is very similar. For the magic populations, at least those we have in rice, and I'm not sure how many you have in, in the wheat community, but we have 5,000 lines. So although the resolution is fantastic, and because of the multi-parent nature, you've got more alleles, and you also have much lower LD or much smaller linkage blocks, the idea that you have to phenotype 5,000 lines compared to 80 lines or 300 lines may be a bit overwhelming. And so you can think clearly. Maybe you should start with 80, find out which region of the genome is interesting, and then you can go and look just at that region of the genome by screening these things first genetically to find the recombinants in the region of interest. It will, it will certainly affect the way you go about your phenotyping if you use genomics to guide your thinking about uh, how to be efficient. I want to come around now toward the end of this talk by talking about the fact that not everybody is on the same page. There are many conflicting motivations when it comes to sharing both data and germplasm. Small public or private sector groups band together 
uh, quite naturally as research consortium and can easily agree to share data and create an economy of scale for problem solving. And that's essentially what the BGRI represents. The large private sector enterprises that already, oh, excuse me, yes, thank you, that already have an economy of scale benefit by greater access to information and materials. And they may be willing to contribute financially to this effort, but they probably will not share data or germplasm openly. Interestingly, in the world today, we also have large coordinated public sector enterprises represented by many countries such as China, India, and Brazil that represent significant economies of scale. They may lack strong breeding and information infrastructure, or at least they may lack a coordinated uh, breeding and information structure, but they want to participate in research consortia and yet they will lack the motivation to share data because they have defined themselves as a closed unit. These are perfectly reasonable things in emerging economies. They happen historically to everyone as they move forward and gain power and ascendance. But it means that we have to all understand this and try to find ways to negotiate our way through it. It has nothing to do with a particular country, individual or institution. Any one of us could belong to any country, any institution, or any particular locale at any, at any time in our lives. It's just that we have to understand operationally how to operate when we're operating in a complex world that, in fact, is the one we live in. So I want to review a couple of things about how we might resolve these dilemmas. Some of us come out of the tradition of public good. A public good is a resource that is accessible to all. And in fact, by definition, individuals cannot be excluded from using it if it's public, and its value and availability do not diminish from use. That's the definition of a public good. Public goods are generally paid for by taxation. They create something we call the free rider problem. The free rider problem occurs when people are allowed to use a resource without paying for it, or when some people pay and others don't. If enough people can use the resource without paying, there's a danger that it breaks the system. In a free market, it's a danger that, that the resource will be underprovided or simply not provided at all. And as that resource disappears and there's no way to pull it back, many people suffer. In the case of germplasm, dissemination of gene bank materials that are, are in fact key to the mission of the gene bank. So the gene bank exists to collect, preserve, and disseminate the materials. The development and the deployment of improved varieties is key to breeding, but capturing the value of those improved varieties is the motivation to own and exclude. And the own and exclude tendency exists in both the private and the public sector. This is not, strictly speaking, a private sector um, way of, of being. Today, what we see is that there is a huge emphasis on ownership. And many of you, many of us in our institutions are being pushed in the direction of trying to define ownership, whether we agree with it or not. So let's think collectively about solutions once we understand the nature of the problem and potential possibilities for negotiating from whichever perspective we're in. Solutions to free rider problems are well known. One is you simply impose a tax on the particular community that's using that resource. You divide the cost equally among beneficiaries, and you try to ensure that everyone who benefits contributes financially to maintain and support the resource. Many people feel that would be fair. Others seek a solution that we can call altruism. In other words, we ask for donations. And by asking for donations, not everybody is required to support the resource. In fact, there will always be some free riders, and those free riders will not donate, either because they don't feel they're in a position to donate, they don't want to, or they don't feel it's worthwhile. But if enough good people are willing to contribute, to donate, then the cost of the, and if the cost of this public good is low and the value is high, then this kind of thing can operate, and that's in fact the way, if you will, that, that the gene banks have been operating for years. They've been operating based on altruism, donations. But those donations are harder and harder to come by, 
And so we risk the loss of the, man, of the maintenance of this germplasm, which so is uh, so essential to the breeding enterprise. And finally, there's always the alternative to privatize. We've seen what happens when major public access or public goods are privatized, and sometimes they become actually more available, better looked after, um, easier to come by. It depends what the price is, whether you feel they're easier to come by. But privatization and its base restricts access to those who are willing to pay. And by restricting access to those who are willing to pay, it has some components of both the taxation and the altruism. So privatization in and of itself, in some ways, is not all that different. It's just that it's a more blatant and obvious sort of door that shuts in your face. And, and many people feel shut out of something that they simply expect it to be there. I put the mix and match up there because I think the solutions that we're looking for aren't going to be entirely one or the other, but probably mixtures of these things. So data sharing among partners to improve the rate of genetic gain in breeding is the concept that we are working with here at the BGRI, trying to figure out how to enhance data sharing, but only if it will actually contribute to genetic gain in breeding. We're not trying to raise the flag on data sharing or, or germplasm sharing for its own sake. We just believe that it may be necessary in order to achieve our goals. So here are the three buckets, if you will, from the database uh, scheme I showed you a moment ago. The germplasm, which is, of course, the source, the genotype, and the phenotype. Some of you work across all of these boundaries. Some of you work in one particular uh, corner of this triangle rather than another. But all of us depend on all of them interacting in a productive way to give rise to new breeding lines. Classical breeding operated along predominantly this axis. The relationship was between germplasm and phenotype, and selection was largely phenotypic. I will say that the international, sorry, this is from a, a slide I had in my own uh, bucket, international rice testing program. You can see <laughs> my coming through. Um, this should have been, I guess, the international wheat testing program. But the point is that people have, for a long time, shared information through these international networks where you had information coming back based on how varieties performed phenotypically in a wide range of environments. And that gave rise to lots and lots of information that has been shared traditionally among breeders. Today, we're working very much between genotype and phenotype, trying to develop models that will under, uh, help us understand how the variation at the DNA level gives rise to variation at the phenotype level. Here, we can put genome-wide association studies. We can also put QTL mapping. Um, all of those sorts of genetic-based um, gen genetic studies are trying to relate genotype to phenotype. The new kid on the block is really genomic selection. You're trying to sort of shortcut the full cycle of managing germplasm by understanding both genotype and phenotype, and you're trying to do genomic selection shortcutting the phenotype by being able to predict the phenotype based solely on the genotype. Now, of course, genomic selection has to have used the phenotype to create the model that allows the prediction to occur, but it is an interesting feature today that we're trying to shorten this cycle in the same way that I showed you a moment to go, uh, that the classical breeding, in fact, never used this corner of the triangle. So classically, we ignored the genotypic component. And now under genomic selection, it's not that we're ignoring the phenotypic component, but we're wrapping it into a model that, in fact, can be explained by the genotypic portion. Back to the idea that we need all three of these corners of the triangle to make sense of what we do, I think in the future, we're really moving towards the ability to utilize all of the components of this triangle in a much more integrated way, and by integrating them and thinking a lot more about how all of them work together, we're moving toward multi-trait modeling, which is going to be, I think, much more, um, much more predictive and much more useful to many people than single-trait modeling. Now, if you're only interested in really um, fast-tracking the resistance portion, 
there's no reason to think that single trait modeling isn't very, um, very critical and very appropriate. But multi-trait modeling may be actually the way in which breeders start to work in the future where they try to take what the breeder sees when they go to the field and all the many dimensions of plant performance are integrated into the human mind. The quest is to take that knowledge and put it into a format that a computer can read. Actually, that's what's going on as we think about trying to predict phenotype based not on the breeder's mind, but based on the genotype, which the breeder's never been able to actually see, but somehow the breeder's been asked to intuit all these years. So if we could only download from the hard drive that is the breeder's mind today, we would actually be trying to model what you already know in hopes that in the future, when there are fewer breeders who come into the field wanting to learn and do what you've done, we'll be able to make predictions based on what you already know. So at some level, I hope that the people who've spent their lives studying the phenotype can understand how valuable it is to, and, and actually what an honor it is to work with you as we try to somehow extract those, those components of your brain that have given you the predictive power you have as a breeder and transform it into something that even a computer can read. In order to make that happen, we have to start housing data in the form of a database. It will not be possible to do this without a database. So here I am at the end of this talk and I want to say we're at a moment of very disruptive change. It's not just UG99 that's disruptive. Many things have come about and present the breeding community with significant disruptive change. We're facing big data, genotypic, phenotypic, and environment data, massive computational power, and both of these provide the basis for multivariate modeling of plant performance. There's more and more emphasis on using genotype to predict phenotypic potential of individuals and populations. The driver is the low cost of genotyping and the high performance of computing. Data sharing and germplasm exchange allows consortium members to assemble information about the pathogen, the resistance genes, and iteratively to develop and test predictions about their performance in the context of the environment. But it does require new data management practices among partners if we're going to ensure timely and systematic sharing of the right data at the right time for the right people, as well as the right germplasm in the hands of the right people at the right time. So I'll end by saying it's most important that we not forget that the basis of all of this requires real people on the ground observing, monitoring, selecting, and reporting about their work with wheat rust. That's where the input comes from. That's the data. And what we can do with that data, we hope, is deploy it selectively, carefully, and with some form of, of a sense of future as we go about our work. So thanks for listening, and thank you all for inviting me to your meeting. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you.